Aegeus was the king of Athens, and although his reign was largely peaceful and successful, he had no heir. He did, however, have 50 awful nephews who all felt entitled to the throne. They ate and drank in the palace and constantly squabbled amongst themselves. The people of Athens dreaded the day that Aegeus might die and one of the rotten nephews became king. Weary of the drama, Aegeus arranged for the elders of Athens to take care of the city while he journeyed across the Saronic Sea to visit his childhood friend Pythias, who was also a king of the city of Trizon. Aegeus and Pythias were overjoyed to see each other and spent many a long night recounting stories from their youth. Aegeus was happy and decided to remain in Trizon longer than he anticipated and continued entrusting Athens to the elders. And so the ship that carried him to Trizon went back to Athens without him. It also happened that Aegeus had become attracted to Pythias's daughter, Aethra, and she was also attracted to him. In time, Aegeus and Aethra were married in the great hall of King Pythias. Though Aegeus kept the ceremony a secret, fearing that his envious nephews might plot against him and his new wife. Meanwhile, in Athens, the city was preparing for the Pan-Athianic Games, played in tribute to the goddess Athena. Contestants had to demonstrate their skill in a series of events ranging from musical competitions to horse and boat racing to wrestling and track events. Androgeus, the favorite son of Minos, the king of Crete, arrived in Athens for the games and quickly became a crowd favorite and beat all of the Athenian competitors. Aegeus's nephews sought to capitalize on this moment to their advantage, and they hatched a plot to get some jealous athletes to ambush and murder Androgeus. And they made it seem as though Aegeus himself gave the order. They hoped to provoke a conflict that would get Aegeus removed from his throne by force, if nothing else. News of Androgeus' death reached his father, Minos, on Crete, and set him on the warpath against Athens. Back in the city of Trizon, Aethra gave birth to a son, but soon after, some of the elders of Athens arrived and told Aegeus of the coming conflict with Crete, and begged him to return to Athens and prepare for battle. Aegeus was torn and struck with grief, but he ultimately decided that he could no longer hide from his duty as king. So he hid a fine bronze sword and a pair of golden sandals in a hollow and covered the entrance with a large stone. He instructed Ethra to keep their relationship a secret out of fear of his scheming nephews and to not tell the boy who his father was until the day that he was strong enough to lift the stone and recover the sword and sandals for himself. On that day, when he would be able to defend himself, she should send him to Athens to claim his place as heir to the throne. Aegeus then set off to Athens, and Ethra raised the boy in secret. Aegeus arrived back in Athens, just in time to prepare to meet the armies of King Minos. Minos's men burned all of the Athenian ships in the harbor, and soon overwhelmed the countryside, destroying villages and farms until they finally came to Athens itself and made camps just outside the walls. Minos threatened that the next morning they would invade the city and tear it down and set it on fire. Desperate to end the lopsided war, Aegeus himself, along with the elders of Athens, rode out to Minos's camp to attempt to come to terms. What have I done to provoke this war? Aegeus asked. A furious Minos responded, What do you mean, what have you done? I had an only son, Androgeus by name, and he was dearer to me than all the cities of Crete and the thousand islands of the sea over which I rule. Three years ago, he came to Athens to take part in the games in honor of Athena. You know how he bested all of your men in the competition, and how the people honored him with song and dance and a laurel crown. But when you, Aegeus, who stands before me now, saw how everybody ran after him and praised his valor, you were filled with envy and plotted to kill him. You had him murdered on the road to Thebes, or, some say, set him against a wild bull to be slain. I don't know which it was, but you cannot deny that my only son's life was taken from him through your own plotting, Aegis, king of Athens. But it isn't true, the elders of Athens pleaded. Aegis, our king, has been in Trizon across the Saronic Sea for some time. We've discovered that the plot against Androgeus was carried out by some of Aegis's jealous nephews, hoping you would remove Aegis from his throne. 
eyeing a distraught Aegis, Minos considered this and said to the elderman, Do you swear to me that this is true? It is true, they replied. Athens has taken something from me greater than any treasure, and in exchange for your city, I require that which is most important to you, to be treated as cruelly as my Androgeus was treated. Does King Aegeus have a son? Aegeus's heart sank as he thought of his newborn son, and he couldn't speak. So an elder, unaware of the boy's existence, spoke up. Our king has no son of his own. This is why his nephews were so eager to see him gone. Minos thought for a moment and said, I don't care for these nephews. You may do with them as you wish. What I demand as tribute is this. Every spring from hereafter, you will send me the seven noblest sons and the seven fairest maidens in all of Athens. You send them to me in a ship with black sails that you will build. And if even once you fail to meet this demand, my soldiers will return and raise Athens to the ground. Leave no man alive and take all your women and children as slaves. After a pause, the elders of Athens spoke up. We will do this as it seems that we don't have a choice, but tell us. What will you do with these tributes? Minos replied, They will be placed in the labyrinth, a place the likes of which you have never seen or imagined, with a thousand winding halls and rooms from which there is no escape. To be your prisoners and starve to death? they asked. No, said Minos. To be devoured by a monstrous beast of Poseidon's doing that we call the Minotaur. Shocked by this, But left with no other choice, Aegis and his eldermen returned to Athens to begin preparing for the first tribute, and Minos' armies began to retreat back to the island of Crete. Years passed, and Aegis and Aethra's son, whom Aethra had named Theseus, was growing into a fine young man with a spotless reputation. He was handsome, brave, and courteous and he spent nearly all of his free time by training, jumping, and running and lifting heavy stones. And every year on his birthday, he went to the hollow with his mother and tried to move the stone. But each year, he failed to do so. And so, he had not been able to get his mother to tell him who his father was. By his 18th birthday, Theseus was very skilled with a variety of weapons, and he had quite the physique. More than a few people compared him to the legendary Hercules. And when he went to the hollow with his mother, he was finally able to lift the stone. He gazed upon the fine sword and sandals and handed them to his mother. Mother, tell me about my father, said an awestruck Theseus. Aethra, proud and crying tears of joy for her son, buckled the sword to his belt and put the sandals on his feet and told him how he was the son of the great King Aegeus of Athens and the sole heir to the throne. She told him why he had to leave when he was a baby the fear of his murderous nephews, and about the war between Athens and Crete, for which she only knew a little. But when the day came that he was able to claim the sword, he should set off for Athens and claim his place. I'll leave for Athens today, mother, he said as they headed down to visit his grandfather, King Pythias. Pythias, remembering the plight of his old friend Aegis, but fearing for his grandson, said, Theseus, you can't go to Athens now. It's too dangerous. There are pirates at sea, and the route to Athens is a very long one. The roads could be quicker, but they're full of bandits and thieves, ten times the number at sea. And to avoid them, you'd have to cross mountains and marshes, inhabited by all manner of wild beasts and dragons and giants. And besides, what about Aegeus's nephews? There are fifty of them. The reason he left you here in the first place was to protect you. Theseus, with resolve in his eyes, responded to his grandfather. Well, then I'll take the road, if it's faster. Then, Theseus, I will send at least fifty men with you. Theseus smiled at his concerned and caring grandfather. No, grandfather, I'll go alone. This is my task. And at that, he kissed his mother and grandfather goodbye and set off to Athens. Along the road to Athens, Theseus did encounter many thieves and bandits and one by one he bested them all. Even the cruelest of murderers and tricksters were no match for him, 
And with every victory won and every captive freed, his reputation in the nearby towns grew, and soon word had traveled that a great hero named Theseus was ridding the entire world of monsters and evildoers, many of whom were legendary in their own terrible ways. When Theseus arrived at the gates of Athens, he found that his reputation had preceded him, and everyone was whispering about him everywhere he went. As he walked towards the palace, he came across some butchers, moving a freshly slaughtered oxen towards the palace. You there! You're the great Theseus we keep hearing about. Ha! <laughs> Finely groomed hair, spotless golden sandals, and you're the one who's ridding the mountainside of the likes of Siron and Procrustes the Pitiless, they laughed. You'd look more at home in a song hall with a face as pretty as that. I'd wager you've never lifted more than ten pounds in your entire life. Theseus wasn't angered by this. Instead, he found it amusing. He smirked, and when the butchers finally stopped jeering him, he turned, picked up the entire oxen off the cart, over his head, and hurled it off. The butchers were dumbfounded, and Theseus continued towards the palace. Concealing his sword, he approached the palace gates. You there, pretty stranger, what do you want? Theseus replied, I am Theseus of Trizon, here to ask for your hospitality which is never refused by men of our race. Theseus? The Theseus who defeated Circeon the wrestler and rid the mountains of robbers? Well, very well, you may enter. I will enter, and I'm going to be a guest of the king. Where is he? Ah, don't bother with the king. He's old and depressed. We're his nephews. We're the ones who really run Athens now. Come and dine with us instead. Theseus entered the palace but he ignored the nephews at their tables and instead walked straight for the king, keeping his sword hidden. Theseus looked at his father and saw a withered old man with much sadness on his mind. Who do you want, young man? Your hospitality. I am Theseus of Trizon. Trizon? Trizon? Oh, you're the Theseus, the hero we keep hearing about. Well, of course. You'll have food and shelter of the king of Athens, as long as I can give it. Then Medea, the king's sorceress, stepped in and had a servant usher Theseus to his guest chambers. Medea, who had gained considerable influence over Aegis, had been paying attention and was secretly aware that Theseus was indeed the rightful heir to the throne of Aegis. Fearing she might lose her influence, she whispered to Aegis that this Theseus was in fact not the hero he claimed to be but rather an imposter, hired by his murderous nephews, and were plotting to have him murdered. Aegeus was terrified, but Medea calmed him by saying she'd already thought of a way to handle it. They would offer him some poisoned wine at the evening's dinner. When Theseus came to the table, he and the king began discussing his travels and the stories that seemed to follow Theseus. Aegeus was drawn to the young man, but still thought that it might all be a plot. And when the roasted meat was brought to the table, Theseus smiled, stood up, and drew his sword to carve it. Aegeus immediately recognized the sword that he'd hidden for his son now almost twenty years ago, knocked the poison wine to the floor, and embraced his long-lost son. The sorceress Medea immediately ran from the hall, never to be seen again. The next day, Aegeus let it known to all of Athens that Theseus was his rightful son and the true heir to the throne. But the nephews, long jealous and plotting for the throne, surrounded Theseus. But the men of Athens, long tired of the brutal nephews, stood by Theseus' side, and one by one the murderous nephews of Aegis were defeated once and for all. Theseus and Aegis spent many days catching up, until one day, heralds from the island of Crete arrived outside the gates. Three days, Athens. Your tribute is due in three days, or you will face the wrath of the armies of Crete, the heralds shouted in the streets as panicked citizens locked themselves inside and the streets emptied. Theseus turned to his father, whose face was full of shame. What's this all about? What right does a Cretan herald have to come to Athens and demand a tribute? Aegeus told Theseus the full story, and of the sacrifice to the Minotaur, that was required every spring to avoid a full-scale war with Crete that they could not win. 
When the day came for the tribute to be offered, Theseus volunteered himself. Aegeus was shocked and horrified. Don't worry, father. I intend to kill this monster and rescue everyone that I can. And when I return from Crete, I'll do so with a white sail rather than the black sail, so that you may know my success long before I arrive. Aegeus, aware of his son's own legendary prowess, reluctantly agreed. And when the ship with black sails disappeared from view, he spent the following days awaiting the return of the ship flying white sails of Theseus's victory. When Theseus and the other tributes arrived at Crete, they were paraded through the streets in front of King Minos and his daughter, Ariadne. Theseus caught her eye. He was the most handsome and heroic-looking man she had ever seen, and it reminded her of the story she'd heard of the hero named Theseus. Father, this group of tributes is the noblest we have ever seen, far too noble to be sacrificed to that monster. The nobler the better, and no tribute will ever be as noble as our lost Androgeus, Minos scoffed. That night, Ariadne lay awake, wondering about the young man she'd seen with the tributes. She got out of bed and headed off for the prison. As she was the king's daughter, she was allowed in, and she found Theseus, along with the other tributes, looking hopeless and terrified. You are Theseus. I am. I'm Ariadne, daughter of Minos. And then she told Theseus of a plan she had that would allow them to escape from the labyrinth. Take this silk thread and tie it near the doorway to the labyrinth. You'll be able to follow it back out. Theseus told her in response that he intended to kill the Minotaur, and that that is why he came all this way. Hearing this, Ariadne gave him back his sword, and he hid it under his cloak. In exchange for helping him, Theseus promised Ariadne that he would take her back to Athens with him once they escaped the labyrinth. When the night of the tribute came, Theseus and the prisoners were marched to the entrance of the labyrinth and forced to enter with the door closing behind them. Theseus quickly and quietly tied one end of the thread near the doorway and unraveled more and more thread as they proceeded nervously through the labyrinth. It wasn't too long and they began to hear the heavy breathing and growling, far away at first, but steadily getting closer. The other tributes began to sob in terror. Stay behind me, said Theseus as he drew his sword, surprising the other tributes. It's getting closer. It's almost here. And he dropped the end of the thread just behind him and prepared to face the Minotaur. This is where we fight. Be ready to run. He's here. Rounding a corner, the Minotaur revealed itself. More than twice the height of a man, with the muscular body and torso of a giant, but the horned head of a massive fighting bull. It snorted and stamped its feet. It raised its arms and prepared to charge. Theseus froze for just a moment, and the Minotaur charged with a deafening roar. Theseus roared back and charged at the beast himself. At the last moment, he jumped to the side and swung his sword with all of his strength. He cut one of the monster's legs off at the knee. It fell backwards and writhed in pain and anger and swung its arms wildly in an effort to defend itself. Theseus nimbly jumped on top of the beast and plunged his sword into its chest grabbed it by the horns, and started beating it. The Minotaur died at the hands of Theseus, and he, along with the tributes he had saved, followed the thread back to the doorway, where they found Ariadne waiting. They headed for the boats and boarded the ship with the black sail and set off for Athens. King Minos awoke the next day to find his daughter missing, the labyrinth door open, and the mighty Minotaur brutally slain. Minos collapsed, in despair. King Aegeus had spent days anxiously waiting by the sea, hoping to catch a glimpse of his son's victorious white sails. But Theseus, overwhelmed with what had just happened, had forgotten all about switching the sails from black to white. When Aegeus saw the black sails on the horizon, his mind went dark. His son had died at the hands of the Minotaur, he thought, and all he had done these past twenty years was in vain. He jumped from the cliffs into the sea and died. Theseus arrived in Athens, only to find that his father had died, and he lived with the guilt that it was quite likely his fault. To this day, it's called the Aegean Sea, after his father, 
Aegeus. And thus Theseus became king of Athens, though he refused the role and ultimately established Athens as the first functional democracy where the people would rule themselves. That is the end of the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. There's a few versions of this story out there with some minor differences, and I'll have some links to those at loreandlegends.net. But what do you think about that story? It's a pretty bittersweet ending, isn't it? In a lot of ways, it kind of reminds me of Game of Thrones, and the character of Jon Snow in particular. A good guy who doesn't know his father, and he ends up on a personal journey of growth while he's on the proverbial road to his destiny. He does everything right along the way, gets the support of the men of Athens, despite hardly knowing them, and he even manages to kill a superhuman monster. But in the end, a seemingly random minor mistake robs him of some of the luster of his success, and he never really assumes the role he spent his whole life being prepared for, one way or another. And while he never becomes king, a new structure is established in Athens that can operate peacefully without him, and the only role he maintains is that of commander of the army. Not too different from Jon Snow, as he subtly smirks at the end of Game of Thrones as he heads north of the Wall, forever free of the drama of Westeros. Or how about the Hunger Games with all this talk of tributes and war, or even the story of George and the Dragon, which I covered in a previous episode? I think you could make more than a few Lord of the Rings references out of this story too. It's really a classic hero's journey. I also think a lot about the Minotaur, and the concept of a dark monster hidden in an inescapable maze. To me, it sort of represents the dark parts of the human mind. The monsters or demons we might all have or need to face, but are generally too afraid to do so. And if you aren't careful, you can get lost. And those monsters or demons can consume you. In this story, those demons especially haunt Aegeus and Minos. In different ways for sure, but in both cases leading to their downfall. The heroes of the story are Theseus and Ariadne, who both overcome the demons of their fathers. Ariadne, by setting up Theseus to kill the Minotaur and escape the labyrinth, and end the vengeful bloodlust of her father. And Theseus, who is literally going into the dark maze that haunts his father's whole life and exorcising the demon within. It's a story of growth and overcoming, I think. Well, if you liked this episode, be sure to check out loreandlegends.net, and it'll take you to the blog post for this episode, which will have some show notes and links for further reading or research you can do on this story. And while you're at it, go subscribe to the Lore and Legends YouTube channel. I'm going to put a short bonus episode directly related to this episode, one that covers the origin story of the Minotaur, which involves King Minos and the god Poseidon. And if you like what I do, consider supporting it by chipping in two bucks which will get you access to a supporters-only podcast feed that will have the bonus episode I just mentioned, along with several others, and more coming in the future that you won't find anywhere else. Or you can leave me a one-time tip by clicking the little coffee icon on warnlegends.net. The last thing I'll mention, I'm on Clubhouse now too. My handle is at Obi Wade. And on that note, I have a couple of Clubhouse invites that I can give out if you haven't been able to get on Clubhouse and want to check it out. But to try and grab one, you're going to have to follow me on Instagram or Twitter and shoot me a DM asking about it. Well, that's all for this episode. See you next time.